Hannington has made the internet into his business. He's been selling mobile credit, so basically access to the internet, for two years, and it's a flourishing business. In Uganda, the number of citizens online has doubled over the last five years. In 2010, around 4 million people were using the internet. In 2016, it was already 9 million, about 22% of the population. A mobile is the, is the future, and, and the future perhaps is now. In Africa, access to the internet has grown considerably since 2000, mainly through the use of smartphones. Prepaid telephone services have made the internet accessible to large parts of the population. Some believe the internet to be a liberation technology, one that helps activists to inform themselves and others, to mobilize and to organize protests. There are a lot of budding innovations that are taking place on social media platforms. Even with civic engagement, we are able to demand for accountability on some uh, issues while maintaining the anonymity that, that we deserve and need, especially on very critical issues. Yes, so I think Facebook is doing a lot in, in boosting the democracy. At the same time, the internet can be used as a tool of repression. Many countries restrict access to specific websites, such as social media and mobile money, while others ban internet access altogether. Access Now, an NGO fighting for digital rights, has counted 183 shutdowns worldwide, only in 2016 and 17. Africa belongs to the most affected regions in the world. In sub-Saharan Africa, 33 national elections took place between 2014 and 2016, both in authoritarian regimes and democracies. In 23 of these elections, there was no shutdown. In 10 of them, there was. These shutdowns mostly happened in non-democratic countries, but some democratic countries experienced them too. But how can the government block access to the internet or specific websites? The Line Command simply wrote a directive to telecommunications companies directing them to blacklist social media sites such as Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp. The technicians at uh, telecommunication companies simply banned IP addresses of these websites. It wasn't something so sophisticated. The internet is owned by a variety of public and private actors, foreign and domestic. Therefore, governments cannot directly restrict access to the internet. They depend on telecom operators, such as Vodafone, Orange, Airtel or Etisalat. We call these companies Internet Service Providers, or ISPs. In Africa, in 6 out of 10 elections that experienced a shutdown, the state was the majority owner of at least one ISP. So, the government has higher chances to block access if it owns parts of the internet's physical infrastructure. But what happened in the four remaining elections when no ISP was majority owned by the state? That is, Gabon in 2016, the Republic of Congo in 2016, North Sudan in 2015, and Uganda in 2016. Let's have a closer look at Uganda. In 2016, access to social media and mobile money was blocked during the presidential elections. Juliet Nanfuka works for CIPESA, an organization that is dedicated to the freedom of the internet in Africa. In 2016, on the day of elections, um, as people were standing at the polls, there was, yes, there was a gradual disconnect that started taking place. So we saw a disconnection to platforms like Twitter, where people were actively relaying information on what is happening at the various polling stations. Um, what is happening? I'm going to vote. Here's my thumbprint. I've just voted. You know, so there, there was a general excitement about what is going on, but suddenly the communication stopped. But the election was overshadowed by violence, arrests, delays at polling stations, a social media shutdown and allegations of vote rigging. Social media is a very good invention. It is going to transform this nation. It's good. We must embrace it. Not so. We're in agreement. But once it's abused 
then you force the government to take drastic measures that will be unpopular. Often the shutdowns are motivated by security reasons, but it does not make them legal. Bill Daniel Opio is a lawyer fighting for digital rights in Uganda. There was no legal basis for that shutdown. Yes, you just wake up and you find that you can't access some of these platforms. We don't have a law that says that the state can arbitrarily shut down uh, access to the internet platforms. Secondly, it was not demonstrated to be justifiable in a free and democratic society. So after successfully curtailing associations, demonstrations uh, offline, so they've now taken the battle online to also curtail it. So, if it is not the state who owns an ISP, who is then behind the companies that are willing to comply with the government's request and block access to the internet? In Uganda, the market is dynamic. Over the last five years, new companies have arrived and others left. But all popular internet service providers are majority owned by foreign companies. They have headquarters in places including France, the UK, India, Lebanon, South Africa and Libya. In a circumstance like Uganda, where you had a shutdown recently, um, the companies that are being asked to do the control of information uh, can often be, as they are in this case, transnational companies. So maybe they have headquarters back in Western Europe or North America. And once they get involved in following local laws and practices, that could raise some pretty significant legal and ethical, certainly corporate social responsibility issues. So, if the shutdown in Uganda was illegal and it was conflicting with international law, why do ISPs comply? Is it all about business? Episodically, um, one can think through a logic of this where the telecoms who are interested, perhaps not so much in the morality of openness and transparency, are interested in continuing to have the availability of cash flow that comes to them because of the, of the services that they provide. To be sure, not only in Africa, but all over the world, Governments block access to the internet with the help of telecommunications companies. In summer 2016, the UN declared that it considers access to the internet to be a human right. Nevertheless, private businesses continue to cooperate with governments all over the world in violating this human right. Sunday, 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 Sunday,